This is the second episode of Stir Crazy. Uh, today we have with us Hannah Kerner, who is an assistant professor at UMD uh, in working machine learning for space-based observation, and Andrew Sloan, CEO and founder of Cosmos Schema, a design firm for new space that thinks uh, aerospace has a design problem. So we will let them intro themselves soon. First, I want to give a really loud shout out to uh, the Blue Origin team for winning the Lunar Lander contract today. That is some really, really exciting stuff uh, for the area and for uh, Blue. So any of my Blue Origin people out there, um, congrats. Uh, we will have a special guest coming in, kind of a blast from my past uh, that I haven't seen in a while, and I'm super stoked, but uh, we'll get into that and the thread that that uh, combines us, uh, Hannah, Andrew, and I, um, as Andrew's uh, snap cam keeps blinking. But <laughs> oh, you can see that? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, so first off, if you want to introduce yourself, Hannah. Sure. Hey guys, I'm Hannah Kerner. As John said, I'm an assistant research professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. And uh, my research is in machine learning for remote sensing data, especially for looking at uh, agricultural monitoring and food security applications. Um, but I, I have dabbled a lot in um, other planets as well. Uh, I've done a lot of work with the Mars Curiosity rover um, and I still do some Mars work as well, but now focused on the best planet, planet Earth. Uh, uh -huh. Very nice. That's what the, uh, you said NASA Harvest? <laughs> yes, NASA Harvest uh, is the program that I work under. It's, the, um, it's NASA Applied Sciences program on agricultural monitoring and food security. So we're actually very different than other NASA programs in that we're not run out of NASA headquarters, we're run out of UMD. I saw that, even though we are close friends and we talk very, very often, I had to research you again. <laughs> and I was looking at that and I saw that uh, NASA Harvest was actually run out of UMD. That's that's super interesting. Um, mm -hmm. you, Mr. Spacey. Uh, yeah. and Hannah, even with that thorough intro, I want you, can you, can you do like an explain like I'm five? You know, treat me like a small child and maybe our audience like a small child and explain to me what, what you actually yeah. do on a day-to-day -day basis or what the programs are trying to achieve or something. Yeah, yeah. So most, of, most of my work boils down to, we have a satellite image of Earth. Where is maize? Where are beans? Mm. Where are cassava? You know, where are different crops? Um, how, how, what is the area of them? And, you know, how much food will we have in country X, you know? So, so you, we're, you know, a lot of learning so, algorithms. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So like on Facebook, you guys have all seen, I'm sure, uh, this feature where you upload a photo and it, it suggests whose face it is, right? It suggests that it's your face, but maybe it has a second choice that is somebody else's face. Uh, you know, there's sort of a ranked list of, of these probable detections. And we use these same methods, but for looking at, images taken by spacecraft of the Earth's surface, but not to guess whose space, but which crop type uh, we're seeing. Cool, got it. So yeah, using smart computers, smart computer programs to look at, you're looking at optical data, like images of, of Earth to try and count all yeah. the we, different, different crops. Yeah. We look at optical data, we look at, and that goes from, you know, visible, red, green, blue, like we're used to seeing into the short wave infrared. We also look at um, synthetic aperture radar, so the microwave part of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. Um, and we also look at, uh, for some other applications, not so much agriculture, but I do some uh, rapid response for disaster monitoring, um, looking at uh, landslide detection, but then also some geology applications. So uh, looking at uh, different hot spots, for example, in volcanoes. Uh, we look at thermal data uh, for that as well. So uh, all, all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Cool, very cool. Thanks for that extra breakdown. That, that helps me, <laughs> at least. 
There's a question. Can you see that, Hannah? What was it? We'll put it up right after yeah. you to yourself. Okay, okay. cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, I'm Andrew, um, and yeah, I run a design agency called Cosmic Schema. We're based in LA, and we do design and brand work specifically for space companies and space organizations, um, sometimes space people themselves. So, um, and what that means, it's funny, like, you know, I'll, I go to a lot of conferences and meet people in the space industry. And when you say you're a designer in the space industry, people are like, oh, rocket design, is it systems design? Or what kind of like, you know, what kind of design are you doing? And I have to say, no, you know, I'm doing graphic design or, or something, you know, uh, adjacent to the industry. So we do, um, yeah, so we apply pretty, pretty simple, basic um, graphic design brand and uh, brand strategy principles to the space industry best we can in an attempt to uh, help uh, help elevate the entire industry with the skill set that me and my team uh, know best and you know contributing in the way that we, in the way that we can um, I feel like you're downplaying it a little bit because you're uh, just a nerd out um, your designs and websites and and whatnot are so easily identifiable and you're actually injecting color into the space industry and and different types of, of aesthetics that we generally haven't seen. One of my absolute favorite things that you, uh, that your company put out, I don't know if it was you specifically, uh, but is the aerospace logo designer. Mm. Where it's just, it's just kind of a, a, a slot machine of choices for a swoosh this way, or swoosh this way and all the, all the different names for uh, that pretty much have been used and reused for space companies all over. So yeah, so, that's a, uh, uh, that's one of our like you know that's one of our entry points and one of our like core ethos is that there's a ton of um, homogeneity in the brands that exist in specifically in private space, um, and what you see over and over again are these like very typical blue swooshes. They're just and we call, we call them swooshes. They're like rocket trajectories, or sometimes they're you know rings, or they're some um, you know reference to parabolic or circular things that you typically see in aerospace. Um, it's always blue, always black. Um, there's just really typical trends. So what you're talking about, you guys can check it out. It's on our, uh, it's cosmoschema.com slash about is where that generator is. Um, but yeah, we just made a thing where it's like a kind of slot machine and, and makes fun of those, uh, those trends. You can kind of see what we're talking about. It's a so we're, we're on a mission, yeah, to, to you know, not... You know, it's not always appropriate to avoid those things completely, but many times because it's a saturated market in, in terms of uh, that, that particular aesthetic, one of the things we aim to do is, is try and differentiate, try and inject color like you're talking about, John. Try and do like something different. You know, make your company stand out if you, you're trying to like trying to succeed, trying to get customers, trying to be memorable. There's so much you can do. That's what I mean by simple design and brand principles. Like pretty, it's pretty basic stuff that we're doing that, that has been ignored by this industry in general. Absolutely. Um, and one of the one of the first things that actually struck me and why I thought this might be a good combination is um, when I first went to your website, I immediately thought of space-based imagery. So mm -hmm. see these, these infrared or near-infrared uh, images of the earth and they're these beautiful, you know, uh, uh, light blues or, or, or bright, reds and whatnot um and immediately went to your went to your website and it was just like oh this looks like what my buddy hannah does <laughs> you know kind of kind of displayed you know in that way i recently there was a twitter thread just about uh science communication and storytelling um that that really hit home that said uh um or that that posited that every engineer or scientist should take one design or a graphic design class in their lifetime um, before or in undergrad. I love uh, that. I love that, Fred. Thanks for tagging me on that. Yeah. I'd be really, really you know, as, as the scientist here <laughs> with lacking design skills, you know, I, I totally agree that we need to do more to um, communicate these products that we're producing better in a more intuitive way. And we try, but you know, obviously we don't always have the skills or the, the knowledge to do that. But you know, I would claim that we should 
instead of having to each take one graphic design class, we should have one graphic designer on every team, you know, that can can work with us to develop those products. Cause it's a huge amount of work to get to, you know, a map that we've produced of where these different crops are. And so, you know, it's a it's a whole other project to try to make that map look really beautiful and uh, intuitive to people who are not also making those maps. Totally, That's yeah. It, it's like, it's, it's a rare thing to find graphic designers or a design department or even a marketing department uh, in-house at small to mid-sized space companies. Um, and, and we've approached some uh, NASA funded programs also saying like, hey, you know, do you need any design work? Just kind of feeling out like where where the need is, and it, it mostly just comes down to budget. People don't budget for it, and I understand why. Like you need every dollar you can to you know to hire people like yourself and, and do the research that that's been funded. Um, but you know you bring up a good point when you're like it's like well how the, the research is wonderful and needs to be done obviously, but if it doesn't move past the scientific community and isn't communicated beyond there, you know, uh, is it, are you missing an opportunity to do that? Yeah, definitely. So we have we have one or two questions. Oh. Hannah, who just froze a little bit. Yeah, I do not know Chris Highsand. Um, I only started at UMD in September, actually. Um, so I haven't even been there for a year yet. Um, so I'm still, and you know, almost what uh, one or two months of that now has been in quarantine <laughs> as well. So um, pretty soon I will spend as much time in quarantine as I have living here in Maryland out of quarantine. But uh, I will look for that person um, when I finally go make a visit to APL. This is the Applied Physics Lab, by the way, run by uh, Johns Hopkins, for those who don't know. And then a good buddy, Paul, was asking yeah is this supervised or unsupervised learning um so the difference between unsupervised and supervised learning is in supervised learning we have uh labels or correct answers that we're giving to the model where we're like here's a picture of a dog this is a dog you're like dog dog cat cat learn to discriminate them you know whereas in unsupervised learning we're like pictures <laughs> find find things that are salient in this. Um, and and so what uh, what we do is actually a bit of both. And it depends on usually what area of the world we're working in. So for example, in the United States, we might have a whole bunch of uh, field data uh, that we can use to train our models. Um, but we, we might also be working in data poor regions where um, for example, in um, we were just approached uh, by the government of Togo in West Africa wanting to know where their fields are located um, so that they can distribute uh, COVID-related aid to these farmers. And uh, we have very, very little data to train a model to identify fields in Togo. Um, so we do some unsupervised learning and semi-supervised learning to leverage what what few labels we have, as well as information from other areas, um, uh, and some unsupervised learning to figure out how to identify those um, those features that we, we might not have many labels for. Very cool. Um, so this is a happy hour, technically. <laughs> so what are y'all drinking? Oh, cheers. <laughs> I thought you spilled it. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, my uh, drink got stuck to my coaster. Mm -hmm. um, I probably have the, I, I'm wagering that I have the least glamorous drink on this call right now. Uh, I would even bet. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drinking? I'm drinking uh, red wine with three ice cubes in it. <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of you. I, this is why I appreciate you and we're friends, okay? <laughs> what, can anyone top that? <laughs> Anna, what you got? When I want red wine that's cold, I just drink sparkling rosé. <laughs> there you go. So you thought ahead. I went to my fridge and I was like, all right, happy hour, happy hour, happy hour. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Nothing's cold. Yeah. 
So I am going with, uh, I figured I'd go crazy if I was drinking to, uh, during quarantine alone. So um, it's the name of this, this thing. Uh, so I'm going with uh, actually something Tanya suggested last week with seed lip. Uh, so it's like a cocktail kind of substitute that has all its herbaceous, et cetera. And then a uh, shit ton of bitters because I, I love some bitters. Hell so, yeah. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Right. Thanks for bringing this together, John. Yeah. Um, wait, what is, is seed lip? Is, is that that like uh, the non-alcoholic um, like yeah. gin, like juniper type yeah. stuff? That yeah. stuff is so good. Yeah, this is like the citrus grove thing. But awesome. speaking of bringing us all together, there is, there. well, I thought there was something that actually ties us together uh, pretty pretty closely. Um, I know when when Hannah and I first started uh, working together um, at Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, she was chair and I was a pain in the ass. And <laughs> we, uh, uh, shortly after starting to work together, um, she came to Arizona State University where I was finished my undergrad uh, to complete her graduate uh, degree and become Dr. Hannah Kerner. Um, and while there, we actually became incredibly close friends. I remember one night we were having, and stop me and tell me if I'm, if I'm telling this wrong because I think I always tell it wrong, but <laughs> uh, we, were, uh, we were having an especially hard time and kind of disagreeing about a lot in how SEDS should be run. And so I was just like, okay, you know what? We're going to the handlebar. We're gonna drink a good amount and we're gonna talk through all of this. And so we started, you know, complaining to each other about each other and then other things that we thought were wrong. And then we were a few glasses in. So we started talking about our life and our background. And I knew you were from California or California. That's that's the other one. <laughs> but I knew you were from North Carolina. Um, but I didn't realize that we kind of ran in the same circles. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? When you were younger. <laughs> Yeah, well, basically, I discovered that we both used to be really into the hardcore music scene. So we would go to, like, we knew the same music venues and the same kind of local bands. Yeah. You know, this is like music that your parents hear and they're like, why would you listen to that? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was so fun. I So many of my, my closest friends in life I met through that scene. Though somehow not John, though we must have been in the same in the same places at some time. Yeah. Um because I was there yeah. for a solid ten years in North Carolina specifically for a solid eight to ten years and uh um and definitely uh um feel like we would have run into each other at some point because I was going to Fayetteville and Winston Salem and everywhere for for shows. Um and then Andrew and I met at uh I forgot one one of these conferences was yeah, this small set in, yeah, small in Utah set. this August, just just not not long ago. And not long ago at all, and we kind of hit it off the game busters because we just I don't know whether we were a few drinks in there or we were just having a good time anyway. But you you were in the kind of Virginia D.C. Maryland uh, more of a this is where you say you're sw you swear you're not like us, even though you listen to Darkest Hour and everything. <laughs> I didn't say I'm not like you. I just wanted to be clear that my, you know I dip a toe in in hardcore. My my, my stuff is more, ended up being more like indie, like yeah, emo. Um, but some, I mean, you know, it, it all it all bleeds together. But I feel like when I met you, John, we like we got to it fast. Like it was like a number of hours. We were somehow figured out that we were both in this in like the DC area music scene. I think it maybe came up through record labels. We're talking about Discord or something. Yeah. Um, uh, and and I assume, do you? I can't remember this detail about you, so you, you'll have to fill me in. But did, did you run a label, or are you involved in a label? Running is is a very 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 aggrandized term for it. Um, running into the ground, maybe, but I did <laughs> really, um, uh, help help a few bands release uh, release their albums. Uh, Time of Cholera from Virginia, The Hotness. Um, uh, help or hurt. I don't know how how people would see it now, but and I've got somebody that can call me on my bullshit on the call that we're about to. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so um, 
just to yeah so i had a i had a yeah because like, that's a huge part of my past also like way be like before i got into space basically i did spend about seven years working at a indie record label in in portland this is after i moved from dc to portland and like just carried like the thread thread through and just went straight into music and kept doing music stuff and that's so, that's where the majority of your creative direction yeah. everything came from right yeah, that's kind of where I cut my chops and, and just learned a lot of what I'm applying now. But um, there's a label shared past, but I know we're about to bring on our, our homie. But um, yeah, so I mean, my, my my teens were spent at Black Cat and, you know, 930 Club, DC9, you know, Rock and Roll Hotel, those those places. Um, nice. Seeing like at the drive in and, and yeah, Darkest Hour from Richmond, Engine oh, Down from Richmond. So many good Richmond bands around that. Oh, so many good Richmond bands. Yeah. 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 Depending on who you asked, you could say uh, Time of Color was Richmond or uh, or Wood. Oh man, uh, I can't even remember. But Nova Richmond or Woodbridge. There we go. Woodbridge. <laughs> Woodbridge, right? Yeah. What a place yeah. to hail from. So we got a few comments that I just want to go through, and people are commenting. We've got some. We've got uh, either Paul or Neutron Waffles drinking sangria. Makaya's got some uh, tequila. Everybody's just running through their their drink choice, which is awesome. Um, Anybody else drinking red wine with ice cubes? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hope not. Um, so, what was your like the your your favorite band? I guess growing up while you were in the scene, Hannah, like band that you could just listen to constantly. This this is leading somewhere, I promise. But <laughs> um. I mean, I really like Between the Buried and Me, who are from North Carolina also. Mm -hmm. um, they had a, a wide variety of sounds, you know? If you weren't feeling what was on, the next song might be different. But then, I mean, outside of the local scene, I really loved Under Oath. Yep. Uh, yep. I listened to them a lot uh, when I was younger. Yeah. But then I, you know, I very quickly moved into, like, uh, kind of dark indie, I would say, like, Bright eyes, Connor yeah. Overs yeah. kind of stuff. Sound Creek just like an annihilated me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Andrew, what was like the one band while you were in while you're in the scene that just? Well, that, that's my answer. It's like is it dark indie was kind of where I went and kind of carried on, and and mine is was cursive. Uh, oh I yeah. Like, I like, I I like <laughs> this close to getting an ugly organ tattoo. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I have friends with cursive tattoos. You so, do. I I don't have a cursive tattoo. <laughs> no, you you said you have friends that do. Definitely friends, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. So yeah, my my uh, I would live and die by the ugly organ. That that album is just like it's a work of pure genius, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. So, mine uh, growing up in Wilmington, North Carolina, there was a band called No One Wins around when I was when I was. Uh, 14 or so, or maybe 15, and then they turned into the Uriah Omen, and uh, then turned into He Is Legend, and uh, there was, there was, I don't think I missed one of their shows while uh, from something like 14 to 20, or 18, or something like that, if I was in Wilmington. Um, so, uh, just do a little intro, uh, we have uh, one of the members of He Is Legend. We'll just play a little, play a little intro here. This is from their new album. No audio. Yeah, are we supposed to hear the audio? You can hear it, John. Oh. <laughs> So I would like to intro, as long as I can stop this, <laughs> introduce Skylar Kroom, lead singer you might have seen there. I'm sure I just embarrassed him, but how's it going? That's, I mean, <clears throat> you can never be embarrassed of your work. You're the, the rule number one, right? Yeah. I can't hear Hannah at all. It's going well, John. It's very good to see you. Yeah. Um, this has all been very riveting, but I, I have not been able to hear a word Hannah's saying, so um oh, no. i'm i'm 
I'm like, yeah, I don't I didn't know how to say it because I'm waiting yeah. in the wings, but I'm going to yeah. I'm going to guess what she was saying. Uh, I want to first say maybe she was drinking um, champagne with a cranberry in the bottom of it. I couldn't tell. <laughs> Are you oh, it cranberries in your drink? Is anybody mm. else able to hear? I can hear Andrew yeah. just fine. Huh. <clears throat> yeah. Can everybody, can everybody else but, hear Hannah? Just drop it in the comments. Yeah. If you can. Well, it might be, maybe you can just, uh, somebody else can tell me what Hannah does and like sum it up. She summed it up for you, explain like I'm five, but then I didn't hear it. So maybe now you have first, to sum it up I think I, for I me. Like I have an obligation to sum it up because I asked for the explanation. Uh -huh. right. Exactly. <laughs> and, I was going to say that, Andrew. I was going to say that about you. Okay. So if I screw it up, Hannah, you can yell at me all you like, but it doesn't matter because you know, I can't hear you. Just, so. <laughs> Hannah, give me a give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if he does well. You know. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm all ears. So uh, Hannah works on a, a research team that uh, I'm, and this is an assumption, but I assume you're working on software that, uh, or like complicated software systems that. Um, look at earth imagery so images of the earth taken from space of all different right. varieties mostly like optical so basically just like what you would see out of any standard camera but sometimes using other data sources like uh you know infrared or things that you can't necessarily see with the camera and taking okay. this, like super complex software to look at that imagery and find um aspects of agriculture in it and um, with the purpose of cataloging, counting, and knowing where um, crops and, and you know, agricultural related activities are happening all over the planet. Um, okay. So, so Hannah, can you, Hannah, can you, are you, do you know anything about this? Like, you're not so far as telling me that I have a fever from space, looking in and saying, that guy's got the the fever. He's there's a fever about this guy. His body temperature is very high. Can, are you in the, in that software no, imaging kind no. of? Uh, she says no. Vein. Oh, good. All right. Cool. No, I'm the highest resolution. Yeah, um, you know we. That's it's cool. Always different. Uh, so agriculturally. <laughs> oh, <you're no>. right. <laughs> she said that she she said that she's gonna start now though. Now that you mentioned it, she's gonna start monitoring you. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> uh, I agree, uh, was that like yeah. pretty accurate? Did I do it right? Yeah, yeah. That was good. That's well, a big, that's big, big bucks. Hell yeah. Yeah, we need, she can hold up a sign or something with where they're at. You need to write it down on a pad and just hold up a big yeah. pad. <laughs> we do have to read money. it off. Yeah. And John, I was like, the, this is the only interview that I've ever done where somebody's named all of my high school bands <laughs> like <laughs> nitty gritty but also <clears throat> i think you are the only birthday party i've ever played oh so, wow so yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. which is uh i'll let i'll let john wait what, what age don't tell me i'm gonna guess <laughs> uh wait uh eight uh i don't know like yeah 24? Nope. nope, not even, not even a little bit. I was <clears throat> 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> sweet 16. Oh, yeah, sweet 16. That, that, that was cool. Been that was epic. Yeah. Yeah. I well, got... wild in an oh. interesting way. Huge house. Yeah. It was a house party. It was a uh, no. It was that um, at like this local kind of club. Or whatever, um, and uh, yeah, my like a like a neighborhood club. Yeah, like a neighborhood yeah. club, and uh, house. Yeah, and uh, my yeah, my girlfriend at the time um, blindfolded me and led me into a room, and uh, uh, then the bust out robotica. I want to say. Oh was, my gosh. It was fairly. Nobody no knows what you're talking about. Now, even if anybody was remotely familiar with the heavy metal North Carolina scene. Like, no one knows it. This is like talking about certain intersections of LA, you know, like it's so regional. 
So yeah. regional, but that's fun. It's fun. Yeah, that was that was not robotica. Fun. Absolutely thrilled. No, oh, so you guys go way back too. Damn. Some dude's on LimeWire right now trying to find that song. <laughs> yeah. Someone is trying to find LimeWire somewhere. Is that, is that even still a thing? Yeah. I, I don't, I, I would hope so. Maybe you can take that too. Um, I had, uh, uh, oh, you said have your coolest space memorabilia around. I have two oh, yeah. cool things. Okay. So you does everybody guys- have theirs on hand? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I can dig mine out. Yeah. Okay, you've got space. Okay, let me go get mine and go. I also, to- also had a question for Andrew. If you, while yeah, you're let's digging your while stuff our, out. Our, our our gracious host is digging through his memorabilia. Plan. Yeah. Thank you, John. Oh, he's got something big. <laughs> Maybe it's not Andrew. Like- um, it yeah. seems like you like in your design. I looked at your website earlier, and I yeah, I dig design too and like you know i have a buddy that's that's that i knew back when we first started playing music that's become a, an amazing designer for rock music and like well all, all genres and he's designing packages and stuff and i saw that you had your hand in some of that as well looking at your website um how much does music play into your design for space is there like a certain genre that you'll that not genre, but like an album, you know. I, I'm also into indie and like shit like that as well. So, oh, sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to oh, swear. Yeah. yeah, but um, <laughs> yeah, well, like, your, like you two just have like a that. vibe. If there's two ways to answer that. It's like, for, on one hand, like you know, I was saying earlier how I kind of like cut my teeth doing basically what you were saying your buddy was doing. I did a ton of like album packaging and like event flyers and posters and shirts and all kinds of stuff like that. And what it kind of ended up turning into was like, I, I, I started realizing that all the bands I was working for, you know, they, they all have their own aesthetic. They have their own, like, like, uh, sorry, I'm kind of glitching out. Um, they have their own brand. Right. And so we like the longer I worked with bands, I realized that there was this, like, cer- the more you could kind of uh, sculpt it and, and be intentional about it, the stronger the, the presence came. Uh, became so anyway that's that's kind of what i took out of that label uh experience and so like the first answer is like the music design and like package design and like uh stuff that i did in my in the past it's like alive and well in in all of the work that i do like it's it's the foundation for all the design work i do and like and as far as like as far as tunes go like when i'm actually like working and what i'm zoning out to during my like two and a half hour scheduled creative block that I have every day from 9.30 until <laughs> 11 uh, or 12, whatever it is. Um, it's, yeah, it totally depends. I mean, a lot of the times in the morning, I'll, I'll, I start with classical. Like, I'll just put on piano, like solo piano music. Um, but, like, you know, John told me about y'all and he is legend and he told me what albums to listen to. And I, I put on um, <laughs> Suck Out the Poison, is that what it's called? <laughs> and and it was like it totally got me on this whole thing and I like started listening to like so much hardcore and I put on Dark Hour again. I even listened to like Thrice Oh yeah. Music, I, and I like went on this whole thing. So uh, it just depends man. Thrice's new album is Thrice's new album is awesome. They're they're still making really killer music. I think they're, that's cool. I gotta check still that out. one of my one of my favorite bands still, man. Uh Thrice <laughs> I think um, has their their last two records have really just blown me away. Artistically. Excellent. I gotta check it's that cool. out. I put on. Yeah, it's like it's it, it's super Amer. It, like I don't want to call them like an Amer, even though they are. It sounds almost derogatory now to say that, but uh, like they're they are they have embodied this kind of uh, I don't know. It's like got this gaslight kind of badass. I don't know. It's a it, they're good records. He's got a. Great soulful way about it. I had a good time. Really like, I had listened to album for like 10 years and I put it on. And I was just like, yeah, I know yeah. all the words to artists in the you say Thrice? Thrice, yeah. Thrice, yeah. So, okay. I, and, and another thing, John, I don't know what you're doing right now, what you're listening to, what you're like, we haven't we haven't spoken in a while, but that and that's bittersweet. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, but it easily, easily fixed now that we're all quarantined for the rest of our lives yeah absolutely um that's that's all that's all it takes yep exactly (laughs) 
Um, so I've been, I've definitely gone the, uh, gone the indie road. Um, also just been obsessed with pop, like female pop music. So uh, anywhere from yeah. you know, Mitski to, to Taylor Swift and, and beyond, that's just been like, not even a guilty like, whatsoever. I'm just, I like Lady Gaga. I'm also right. jealous of Andrew's um, all of all of your little uh, yeah, I your gags. That. Your, that your, cool. How are you? Is that something? Do I have to download the app to yeah, get these gags? Yeah, yeah, I spent like half an hour today preparing for this exact moment. So, so we've got a wow. question from the audience that uh, that actually necessitates one for you, Skylar. Um, oh, cool. So in case you didn't hear. Today, a whole bunch of what are you drinking? Oh, I'm drinking a, a, a mezcal. Ooh. This is my space thing, too. Look at this. Oh, nice. nice. Oh, yeah. Perfectly. That's yeah. Exactly where we're going with that. Yeah. I have two. I'll show you the other one later. Nice. Um, this is like mezcal and fresca and um, like fresh lime. Oh, yeah. It's a, uh, it's pretty, it's a, it's a drink I learned in Mexico that just is like dynamite. Yeah, definitely. Oh, is that the? I probably have the bougiest one. <laughs> the, uh, they serve it in the little like low glass bowls, or not glass, uh, ceramic bowls. I always forget what they're called, but they're. Yeah, I got mine in a solo cup. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we we were just. Uh, it was just announced that Blue Origin, SpaceX, and Dynetics um, have won contracts from NASA to send humans back to the moon, or um, lunar land, a human lunar lander back to the moon. So yes, have thoughts? I want to do it. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I'd, I'd go in a heartbeat. Not necessarily Mars. Um, I, don't, I think that's a little bit too long of a haul for me. But uh, yeah, do you have any um, opinions? Would you would you actually go? Would you? Um, would you get out of the out of the module? Uh, me personally, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, I would. I yeah. actually don't. I don't believe that we ever went to the moon, but I don't <laughs> want to talk about that on this show. This is the wrong <laughs> place to bring that up. <laughs> I know. I, I had all these conspiracy theory questions because, like, you know, I love, I love conspiracy theory, and I know it's all bullshit, <laughs> but it's fun to 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 like think about. And I know we've been to the moon a million times, but I do not think we went when we said we did. And I completely think that was a farce. And that's what I like truly believe. I don't think that 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 we went back then, you know, but whatever. I don't like I don't want to stand on a platform right now about anything like that. But I do like there are these crazy things like about Jack Parsons and his occult, uh, you know, um, affiliation and and things things that he did like he you know uh, invoked he read like the invocation of Pan right before his rocket launched you know <laughs> uh, wild crazy stuff. What's your favorite uh, conspiracy theory of all time? I, I like that one. Uh, well, that's not even a conspiracy theory. Just Jack Parsons' occult affiliations. I thought was crazy. Um, I'm not even familiar. But my favorite, my favorite, I made one up actually that I really like. Um, I actually made this one up. Um, so aliens built the moon and put it a certain distance away from the earth so that, that it would be like, you know, perfectly eclipse the sun at certain points and govern the oceans and the tides in order to make life and watch it through a big giant um, microscope. Just in case. Can you imagine? We decided to do that to another species and if we were like, strong, but yeah, I, yeah, you know, we should do no, no, it. I, is, I, I, love, I love conspiracy theories yeah. for sure. Oh, Kenneth. sorry, <laughs> you're gonna have to interpret for her because I can't hear what we're saying, Anna. <laughs> Yeah, I was just saying, you know, like imagine if we as a species decided we wanted to do that to another species that we were the alien species that was like, you know, we should do with our time go put a moon perfectly uh, at this distance away from the earth so that it could eclipse them. That'll really mess with them later. You know, I wonder why that moon is there like that. And they'll never know. Hannah said, imagine, imagine if, we, uh, if we were the aliens to say, yeah, we're just going to go put a moon hanging there. And why the hell we would do that? 
essentially. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't believe the thing that I made up. I know it's false, but I like to talk about it. <laughs> well, the, I mean, the, the alien theory, like building your it. theories credit. It is my favorite beautiful coincidence that the moon perfectly blots out the sun in alignment on a total solar eclipse. Like that is yeah, like it is. remarkable, you know, cosmic dance that we are lucky. But you know, it's like or it's only only <laughs> or maybe the aliens did it, man. Wait, <laughs> come on, tell me more. Wait a second, yeah. <laughs> No, I, uh, I do love I, I do love like reading of about conspiracy theories and, and stuff like that. That I, that's why I think it's so like you know the, that part of space, the thing that the like how people want to sensationalize certain things like Planet X, like the Nibiru thing. There's the there's the glasses, Nibiru, whatever. You know what? Are you familiar with the, the Egyptian? Yeah, the, planet. the Egyptian like Planet X coming from the depths and the South Pole telescope that they built down in Antarctica was like, took eight years to build it. And they're using that just to look at this one thing. Cause it's coming was, from the bottom. So all um, of that, all of that stuff was, uh, was like flat earth specifically about seven years for me was my favorite, like trash TV. Essentially. Mm -hmm. It's so fun. It's I, was so doing, fun. I was addicted to it until like the flat earth society came about and like people actually large amounts of people started believing it. And I was just, I, I oh, felt yeah. for, for adding, adding likes and everything to the, to the bullshit. <laughs> you know? Did you guys see the, the flat yeah. earth, uh, Netflix thing, the, the documentary? I haven't, I haven't. It's, yeah. it's so good. It's so good. Earth. like, yeah, beyond the earth. It's, they just do such a great job, like not lending any credibility. They don't, they're not talking about whether or not the earth is flat. They're, they're talking about like the whole moral of it ends up being how like there are so many people that have such excellent critical thinking skills and are curious about the natural world and have like fallen through the cracks of science and oh, yeah. are, like, are like being missed by people like us that you know could support them and bring them into the realm of reason but they don't have that support network so instead they get wooed by you know other theories and because you, you watch these people that are really into flat earth and all kinds of other stuff and they're and they get in deep and they're running experiments and they're like you know really really think, spending a lot of mental energy on this stuff but it's all all to all for naught and you know improper scientific method and so on and so forth uh, Mark agrees. Yeah, it's such a good documentary. It's uh, they really nailed it. I need to check that out. What's it yeah. called again? Uh, what's it called now? Beyond the curve. Beyond the curve. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think that's right. That's cool. Um. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a crazy flat earther. I swear to God, I, I <laughs> do. I know the Earth is round and spins. Um, no. Or is please. it? <laughs> or it? That's what we're gonna get to the bottom of tonight, folks. So this is actually um, um, uh, an interesting question with with design, space, music, and everything. Only seven. Hey, Only um, would be curious to hear thoughts on synesthesia and or color associations people have with the space industry, academia, music, um, and connections thereof. Um, so, so I'm assuming um, what kind of I actually need a little clarification on that on that uh, question, but what kind of um, music or or other experiences would elicit some type of space like imagery? Um, I'm not sure, but I think you no. Know, what you're asking, I think, is like like um, I mean, you know, for know, example, what kind of music do you, do you to listen to when you create? <laughs> We'll translate. Yeah. I feel like we've got to put up. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, there's like a strange portal happening between these windows that I'm seeing. Um, I'm going to kick. Hmm. Everybody else can hear. Interesting. Um, I don't know why it's my, she's just on mute, like completely on mute. And I've looked through like while you guys were talking before. But. I mean, I can log off and try to come back in if you need. Here, I'll, I'll kick you, Skylar, and then uh, come back. Okay? And see yeah. if you can hear. Okay, cool. Okay, what were you saying, Anna? 
Um, I just think she's asking like, uh, are there, for example, this is probably a question for Andrew. Are there companies that are like, no, we have to have blue. Like we can't have pink. Think that would be ridiculous in our logo. Like people wouldn't associate us with being a serious space company. Like, are there you know zones of color space or or properties of shapes or uh, maybe for example like that that um, that companies or the industry feels like they have to uh, capture? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I mean I love I love projects when conversations about color get into to those depths, but it doesn't happen all the time. Um, and I think that blues and blacks are a pretty safe default for a lot of people in their mind because it's the color of the sky, it's the color of space. And, you know, case closed, like no need to really do much more investigation beyond that. Um, so, um, but, you know, when you start getting into more interesting colors, you can do things like consulting color theory and trying to figure out what um, emotions are elicited by certain colors or what types of reactions people have to certain colors. And that stuff is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good to, for it to be a voice in your ear, but you can't lean on it too heavily because it's, I, I find it to be pretty subjective. Um, but um, I, uh, you know, for instance, we work with this one company um, called Momentus and they, uh, their main, product is a, a, a water-based plasma uh, propulsion engine and the plume of the plasma jet is pink um, or this kind of like rich magenta. So um, going into that project, founder uh, Mikhail Pokerich was just like, I want pink. Well, let's, let's find pink somehow. Like, well, let's figure out a way to do pink. So going into that project, we're like, yeah, all right, let's go. Like we can, we can really milk this. And if you look at their brand now, it's, it's rare, you know, pink and pink and white and, and like, uh, you know, gray. Um, so and we had fun with that brand. We got we got to name that color uh, plasma magenta. <laughs> oh, plasma magenta. Nice. Uh, can you hear Hannah now? Or can you hear now? No. <laughs> no. What if what your if, computer is like? Because you did something when you said. were playing our video, and he and Andrew said I couldn't hear it, and you did something that made it work. Oh, okay. um, maybe about, you can do something that makes about, it work. What about this? How are we doing? Hannah, mic check. How about now? Testing, testing. It's like I can hear like the very back end of the clip of Mike, but I can't hear. Damn. Well, we've only got a few more minutes uh, anyway, uh, but. You did all right. <laughs> I'm sorry to step on you. Constantly, Hannah. I really, I promise I didn't mean anything by it. I want to see your guys' weird space stuff. Ugh. It's not weird, but I figured. Oh, uh, yeah. I love that poster. It's really applicable because it's just, it's a good representation of all the space missions that are out there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> just about ready to cut Skylar's head off. Nice. <laughs> you can't even hear it. <laughs> he can't even hear this. <laughs> Does it whir when you move around? Oh, I know what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Star Trek, okay? Fired <laughs> <laughs> an entire space following in one sentence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mistaking Star Wars for Star Trek, declaring the moon landing didn't happen. <laughs> this guy's got to go. Ooh, yes, hell yeah. that's we'll awesome. to bring them all right back. Redemption. <laughs> Redemption. Let's talk about aliens, guys. Do you guys have any? Uh, that is awesome. Do you guys have a contact featuring Jodie Foster shirt? Damn. That glows in the dark. That's pretty great. Oh, oh that's awesome. awesome. What is this? Wow. It is simultaneously the coolest space thing and the most metal thing that I own. Let's got it. I've got a. How do I? Yeah, um, that's sick. Uh, forgive yeah. Oh, wow. That is intense. <laughs> Oh, that's really cool too. This is, uh, so this is an oil painting uh, that my dad did in the seventies. Um, really? Right yeah. So this is this is a actual the, the actual painting um, after the Challenger blew up, and right. the basically this the space program started getting defunded, like pretty rapidly defunded after that. There was a lot of fear, and and it was just like 
kind of the end of, of that era, you know, uh, or like the end of like the Apollo era and kind of the slow decline of shuttle era. And um, so this, it's just, you know, pretty obvious metaphor of, of an astronaut. Very cool. And like, yeah. forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do is about the NASA admins saying, no. you know, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're hanging out here. Dang, that is it's, intense. It's that it's heavy. Right, yeah. Should I put it on my video conference? <laughs> like, I just have it like always right behind me. I don't want to people up for sure. <laughs> What was your hanging upside down? Yes. <laughs> what was yours, Hannah? Oh, I had a few. I mean, so I have my lightsaber. Oh. My mom got me these uh, Apollo salt and pepper shakers at <laughs> Barrel. <laughs> Cracker Barrel near you in North Carolina. Oh yeah, nice. Yep. Um, I had some other things like you know. Anna Fisher. Oh, this is yeah. actually a painting that my cousin did. That's awesome. Nice. Very cool. Also, let's continue. Ooh. Got this. Uh, these silicon wafers Those going silicon all the way back to 1963. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like, <laughs> cool. My grandma um, worked for Signetics before it was Philips in uh, Santa Clara and did like pure purity testing of silicon wafers by inspecting them with uh, scanning electron microscopes. And she saved them and gave them to me. Her grandma got them in 1953 when she was t doing testing for Philips by scanning these super thin silicon wafers with an electron microscope and saved them. Okay, well. I'll be damned. Just show how to, much bigger I want to that take a picture of it and send it to me. So, <laughs> um, uh, so we got to we got to wrap up here, um, as there's the uh, Seattle Space Entrepreneurs webinar next with uh, Sean McClintock and Stan Shaw. But um, question for you: Didn't you record an album in Seattle, or did or am I mistaken? No, our, our first record label was in Seattle, um, oh. but we never recorded there. We oh. recorded in um, in L.A., um, and pretty much every other record's been done in North Carolina, but we did one out in, um, in L.A. And actually, no, I take that back. Um, I am Our first album was done up in Boston, like or outside of Boston in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, that that was where the first one was. But no, no, no Seattle. No Seattle. We did drive a U-Haul trailer after our van died in New Mexico. We drove a U-Haul trailer. Um, well, actually, the the cargo box. We drove that up to Seattle from Deming, New Mexico, after our van died, and everybody slept in the back. And we, you know, me and our, my drummer were the only ones driving. It was the worst, the worst time of our lives. But we <laughs> got there. We made it there. Turned around and drove back to Wilmington. And you were actually back to North Carolina on tour right as all this COVID stuff happened, right? Yeah, we were in my birthday. On my birthday, we were in Reno and we were we were had a day off. You know, the drives had been pretty long and we got a call basically saying all of your the next week of your shows are are kaput. Yeah. So we had, had to turn around and drive home, which it's nothing we've never done, but driving home in the midst of a pandemic and looking at the fear and uncertainty in people's eyes as you're as you're actually getting back to your hometown where you have to stay locked in a house for a month and a half, two months, two years, however long we're we're supposed to do this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been pretty pretty wild. I imagine. Are you at, are you all of you at home with loved ones and safe and sound and all that? Safe and sound. I am. I am isolated. <laughs> it's nice, man. Yeah, I actually, I'm I'm kind of kind of enjoying it. Um, from a uh, being able to reset and you know, I was traveling about three weeks out of out of every month um, since I started this job. Yeah. And, Nice to actually be in, at home. I wish I could enjoy Seattle more because um, I, I absolutely love it up here. But I've been, um, it's it's a cool and quirky place for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's awesome. I love it. It's like uh, I I like Portland a lot too. Um, do you make it out there ever? Yeah, I made it uh, when I was coming back from Alaska after the Air Force. Did a long road trip, and uh, my girlfriend and I at the time um, uh, uh, stopped in Portland and went to a McMenamin and then met a waitress there. She sat down after shift got off, and then she was just like, hey, do you want to just crash with us since all the hostels are booked up and you can't afford a hotel? And uh, so we crashed, ended up crashing with her. I think her name was Molly Gray for a week almost until other guests arrived and just met all of her friends and just had an absolute blast. And it was kind of like the perfect picture of Portland for me. I lived there for 10 years. Hell yeah. <laughs> well, Portland. Beautiful spot. Yeah. That, that's where that label was that I was working at. Absolutely. That's gorgeous. Um, what have you, what's, so you, okay, we're going to lead into the space entrepreneurs happy hour while I find this link, but you used to run the new space conferences up here, Anna, right? Yeah, that's actually the last time I've been to Seattle was in, I think 2016 when we ran that conference there. Cool. Damn. Um, sorry, I'm looking for this link. Um, if anybody has the link to the Space Entrepreneurs Happy Hour or webinar, uh, please feel free to drop it here. Um, that is all of the time we have. Thank you all so very, very much. I really appreciate it. I uh, hope you had a good time, and it's awesome to reconnect with you, Skylar. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, uh, thanks for indulging my silliness, guys. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for bringing it. Sharing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, that's all we've got for this week. Next week, uh, we'll be doing the Korean Spicy Noodle Challenge with my friends Stephanie, Lindsay, and Marina um, while answering some spicy space trivia. So see you all next week. And that sounds fun. Yeah, <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> Bye. Bye.